everybody. My name is Jenny Smith, and I'm a program supervisor uh, within a residential program at Lutherwood. I'm also the chair of the collective of individuals that puts together the speaker series. So um, I'd like to take a minute to introduce our speaker for tonight. Tanya Young is a clinician in Children's Mental Health. She comes to us with uh, several years of experience working with uh, young people with mental health issues, and she's going to talk to us specifically about kind of anxiety and what that looks like and strategies to support young people who are experiencing anxiety. So um, please do know that the washrooms, they are around the corner here and left and left again. If you need to use the washroom, you will see signs posted. We've got some refreshments and cookies around the side. And please take a moment to fill out the feedback at the end of the night to provide us with that valuable information. Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm glad you can make it. Um, and feel free to trickle up closer to the front if you want. I know everyone's kind of picked the middle to the back. And uh, don't hesitate to get up and get a drink or a snack while I'm talking. I won't take offense to that or if you need to take a washroom break. What I'm going to do is get started on my presentation and we'll save questions for the end. So uh, if you want to jot them down or just try to remember them, we will spend about half an hour at the end of tonight's session to, to go over the questions. So, as Jenny mentioned, I will be talking to you tonight about managing anxiety in the team. So, we're going to start with basically what is anxiety. So, anxiety is the uneasiness, worry, or tension we experience when we expect a real or perceived threat to our welfare. It is necessary for preparation and protection from danger. So, you might think, okay, that's a boring definition of anxiety. What's important to note about this definition is that it could be real or a perceived threat. So oftentimes people who don't struggle with anxiety will look at those who are struggling with it and kind of say, I don't get it, what's your deal, what are you so worried about? For the person who is struggling with anxiety, whether it's a real threat or perceived, it's there, it's very real for them. So anxiety disorders are a group of disorders which affect behavior, thoughts, emotions, and physical health. It is believed that they are caused by a combination of three things. So biological sensitivity. So if a parent, a sibling, an aunt, an uncle is struggling with anxiety, then your child may be at higher risk of struggling with anxiety as well. It's just like a medical condition. If somebody in the family has diabetes, then your child might be at higher risk for that. Personality, and by personality we mean temperament. So maybe the child has a temperament that's predisposed to being more anxious. And then stress overload. If a child doesn't have healthy coping strategies to manage anxiety or stress, then they be, may become easily overloaded with it. So why do we need to pay attention? Anxiety disorders can result in impaired learning and interpersonal development. The tendency for anxiety stays with people as they age, but, be, but can be better controlled if addressed. If anxiety is not addressed, it can persist and may lead to other disorder, disorders in adulthood. So anxiety often goes hand in hand with depression. It can become a bit of a vicious cycle. Uh, other disorders it can lead to, oftentimes people may kind of self-medicate with alcohol or drugs to numb the symptoms of anxiety. So it's important to intervene early so that children and adolescents can become skilled at controlling the anxiety. So I've listed here a number of different types of uh, anxiety. Now, because we don't have too much time tonight, I'm not going to go into each definition, but it is in your handout package so that you can make reference to it. Um, and as you can see, most of them are really self-explanatory. So, separation anxiety is anxiety related um, to being separated. You see this quite commonly in younger children. So maybe you're taking them to their first day of kindergarten class, and they're clinging to mom or dad. They don't want to leave their side. That's who they feel safe with. Generalized anxiety disorder is just what it says, so it's generalized across all areas. Social anxiety disorder would be anxiety in social situations. Panic disorder is when we see a, a strong bodily reaction to the anxiety. So people who suffer with panic disorders will tell you they're very real and they're very frightening. Oftentimes it feels like describe a tightness in their chest. They feel like they can't breathe. They might have numbing and tingling in their arm. Um, sometimes people will actually end up in the emergency room because they've mistaken an anxiety attack for a heart attack. So it's very real and very frightening. Obsessive compulsive disorder uh, is when there's obsessive intrusive thoughts that then lead to compulsive behaviors. So maybe the intrusive thought 
is a fear of germs, of, of being contaminated. And the person then feels the compulsion to shower a certain number of times a day or wash their hands. If they, if they feel they've been contaminated, they have to go through that ritual again. Post-traumatic stress disorder is anxiety that's related to a traumatic event the person has experienced. Uh, specific phobias would be, there's a variety of them. It could be a fear of heights, spiders. Um, for younger children, we often hear a fear of thunderstorms or natural disasters. And then the last one on the list here is selective mutism. That's, again, commonly seen in younger children where they're comfortable speaking within their home environment. So in the safety with mom and dad, siblings at home, they're comfortable. But you put them in a school setting and they refuse to speak, or maybe you're out in public and they, they refuse to speak. So that's just a really quick overview. As I say, just make reference in your handouts and let me know if you have any questions at the end. So I wanted to give you an idea of age-appropriate fears. So for infants, for example, stranger anxiety is quite common and very normal, right? They cling to mom or dad when they see a stranger coming. It usually passes its phase. Toddlers, separation. So again, you're, you know, you're taking them to preschool. They don't want to leave your side. They kind of cling to you. Very age-appropriate. With the preschool, there's often a fear of large, harmful, dark imagery. Again, that's very age appropriate. For elementary school kids, it shifts to dangers of the world. For middle childhood, fear shifts to academic expectations, social competence, natural dangers, and death. And then in adolescence, the fear shifts to more abstract things, like fears about relationships in the future. So I wanted to give you some examples of how anxiety might be expressed. So with younger children, it's usually outward distress. So you might see freezing and crying. In early childhood, you may notice that they're restless, irritable, maybe they're complaining of aches, nausea, they're having meltdowns, and they're needing lots of reassurance. Now at this age, they're not able to recognize what's going on for them. So it's not like they can look at you and say, Mom, Dad, I'm having this meltdown because I'm getting really anxious that I have to go to school today. So for other people around them, it may seem that they're being unreasonable. And then for older children, uh, the expressions of anxiety shift to be more internalized. So you might notice that they're worrying and showing uh, symptoms of withdrawal. So parents will often come to us and say, I'm not sure. I think my child, my teen is struggling with anxiety. I'm not sure though. What's, what's considered normal? What's considered problematic? So just another table for you to, to break it up. Normal anxiety would be reasonable, whereas problematic anxiety would be excessive. Normal anxiety would be protective, whereas problematic would be detrimental. Manageable versus uncontrollable. Mobilizing versus paralyzing. Um, just an example, for most people, if they have an exam coming up or a presentation, you get a bit anxious about it, but it mobilizes you from, you know, it might motivate you, okay, I need to study, I need to prepare for this presentation. If the anxiety is problematic, it's actually paralyzing. So you might hear your team saying, I can't focus, I can't study, I can't go write this exam, I don't even think I can make it to school that day. And that would be the key difference. Um, specific versus pervasive, time limited versus chronic, and of course age, mis age match versus age mismatch. So another way to tell whether it's an anxiety disorder, we call this the four Ds. Is the anxiety disproportionate? Is it causing disruption to their daily functioning? Is it causing them distress and the duration? If it's something that's sticking around long term, it's, it's probably problematic. Some additional red flags for anxiety. If you're noticing out of character behaviors for your child, maybe they're agitated or they're easily distressed. They're asking a lot of what if questions and they're seeking reassurance. I worked with one little girl that when she was in the car with her dad would do a lot of, Daddy, what if we run out of gas? Or, Daddy, what if it starts raining and the windshield wipers don't work? What if we get lost? So, a lot of what if questions, again, seeking that reassurance. You may notice a decline in attention. Maybe they're struggling with depression or withdrawal. Again, there could be complaints of aches, pains, nausea. Some perfectionistic tendencies. Maybe they're slower than usual. They're late getting to school. They're not completing tasks. Maybe they're refusing to go to school altogether. Struggling with sleep, avoidance, and showing significant distress. So anxiety cognitions. Um, 
people that struggle with anxiety, there's usually a theme in their thought patterns. So that's what anxiety and cognitions means. Uh, it, there's an overestimation of danger and threat for them. They tend to expect the absolute worst possible outcome. There's a sense of uncontrollability. That's why it's really important for them to, to know what to expect. So they like routine, they know what, what to expect because it helps them control their environment. Uh, they often feel responsible for negative outcomes, even when they're not. They underestimate their own coping abilities. They have a need for certainty. And again, there's a tendency towards perfectionism. I'm going to touch just briefly on anxiety and school refusal right now, and then we'll get back to it towards the end of the presentation. But again, I just wanted to give you some examples of how this might present with the different forms of anxiety. So a separation anxiety, your team may be saying, can't go to school because if I do, something bad might happen to me, something bad might happen to you, I don't want to be separated from you. So generalized anxiety, it might be I'll get a B on the spelling test and that's not acceptable, that would be considered an absolute failure in their world. Performance anxiety, I can't read out loud in class. With social anxiety, they could be worrying that no one's going to talk to them at recess or the lunch break. With panic, it could be I'll faint and no one else will be able to help me. And then if you're struggling with adjustments to transitions, it could be that high school is simply too stressful and I can't, I can't go, I can't manage that environment. So parenting responses. Parents may unwittingly fuel anxiety sometimes and always have the best intentions, but sometimes you end up fostering avoidance and refusal. So if they're refusing to go to school or participate in an activity, and that generally happens because we find it's easier to give in we hurt, you know, you're hurting for your child because you see them hurting, you're afraid to push them. And so sometimes you think, instead of pushing them, instead of starting World War III, I'm just going to say, okay, you don't have to go, right? But what happens when you do that is you reinforce the behavior and the avoidance. Maybe protective and closely involved, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, unless when your child's spinning with anxiety, you're spinning right along with them, then we just need to pull you out of it for a bit. You may find that you're walking on eggshells to avoid upsetting your child. You may be on high alert for distress and rush to fix the problem, so you're feeling this pressure to always be five steps ahead of them. You may hesitate to encourage them to take risks, and you yourself may feel sad, frustrated, and angry or guilty. How anxiety impacts the family. Everyone in the family might be feeling guilt, empathy, and overprotection for the person that is struggling with the anxiety. There may be a pendulum response or polarization. So you might find for that a few weeks, a few months, you've been taking, you know, you've been really gentle. So nothing but supportive, positive reinforcement. And then one day you kind of scratch your head and you go, this isn't working, I'm not seeing any change. That's it, from here on in, it's tough love. So you might be going from one extreme to the other. Overcomes, overcompensation. Uh, so the more one parent yells, the more the other parent coddles. And we hear about this all the time. Parents will come in and kind of say, one will say, he's too strict. And they'll say, well, she's too lenient. So it can often lead to some marital discord as well. There's the hardship to siblings. And so we really do view the family as a secondary sufferer. So now that we talked a little bit about anxiety, I wanted to shift into where to go from here. So strategies to manage the anxiety. So, stress and anxiety. When you're in real, immediate, physical danger, it's absolutely appropriate to feel afraid, right? So if a bear's coming your way, you're gonna feel afraid. However, most of the time, when we feel stressed, there's no immediate danger, so it's actually a false alarm. We know this is a physiological response called the fight or flight reaction. So that helps us to either fight the danger or flee forth from it. So we're gonna stick around and fight that bear, or we're gonna get the heck out of it. So in the long run, it's obviously better to learn how to avoid stress in the first place. Thinking peaceful thoughts makes you relaxed and vice versa. So if you're feeling relaxed, you're much more apt to be thinking peaceful thoughts. And this ties into the basic premise of cognitive behavioral therapy. It's kind of a mouthful, so we short form it to CBT, which states that our feelings and behavior are largely caused by our own thoughts. So CBT challenges us that if we can control our thoughts, we'll control our feelings and our behavior. We can change our thoughts. 
So the anxiety triad um, just demonstrates this with the visual, how our thoughts can impact our physical arousal, which can in turn impact our behaviors. And it doesn't necessarily always go in that order. It could be that your behaviors are impacting your thoughts. So just to stress that a little more, if you have a child at home and they hear a noise at the window, if the thought is that someone is breaking in, they're probably going to panic and they're going to feel scared. Whereas if the thought is that it's just a branch hitting the window, they're much more likely to feel calm. And so that's just a demonstration of how two people could have the exact same experience but perceive it very differently. So CBT is the first line choice treatment for anxiety. It has scientific backing with an 80% success rate. The goal is to bring the anxiety to a normal range, not to take it away altogether, as this would be unrealistic. So this is key as well. Sometimes you just want life to get back to normal. Maybe your teen hasn't been going to school, you're worried about if they're not getting their credits, are they going to fail their year? You just want life to get back to normal. Um, if you go seeking out counseling or supports, though, with the idea that there's going to be a quick fix, you're probably setting yourself and your teen up for failure. It will take some time. So just to keep in mind that the idea is to bring the anxiety within a normal range, that's what's realistic, not to get rid of it altogether. So shifting into some of the CBT techniques, the first one is realistic thinking. And I just want to stress that there is a difference between realistic thinking versus positive thinking. So for example, if your anxious child has come to you and they're really upset, they're telling you something that's bothering them, and you do that, now, now, don't worry about it, it is not helpful. Anyone with anxiety will tell you if it was that easy to just not worry about it, I would be doing that, right? So realistic thinking is specifically directed at anxious thinking. It's finding the evidence, judging the accuracy of the person's beliefs, examining alternatives, estimating realistic probabilities. And I'll just give you an example here. I had the opportunity to attend a two-day training in Toronto a couple years ago, and the topic was on using CBT for children and adolescents with anxiety and OCD. Uh, the woman that put the training on was a psychologist, a brilliant woman, and so she talked to us about a little girl she was working with that had anxiety about missing the school bus. So she was terrified that she was going to miss the school bus and have no way to get home at the end of her school day. So the psychologist literally pulled out a calculator with her to start estimating the realistic probabilities to show that it's really not that realistic. So she said to this little girl, how many times have you missed the school bus so far in your school career? Well, I haven't. So she, on the calculator, took the number of days in a school year, multiplied it by the number of years she had been attending school, and kind of said, look, in, in thousands of days, you've never missed the school bus. So on the very slim chance that you did, what's the worst thing that could happen? So the little girl kind of went, I don't know, I guess I go to the office and I tell them that I missed the school bus. Well, then what would happen? I guess they'd call home to my mom and dad. Then what would happen? To come get me. So you can see how realistic thinking really gets at the core of some of the thoughts to challenge that. So moving along in therapy, this little girl was able to say, I've actually never missed the school bus, and the slim chance I did, the worst thing that could happen is I go to the office. It's not so bad after all. Um, so again, exploring the worst consequences and putting things into perspective. As another form of realistic thinking would be thought stopping, and we commonly use this uh, STOP acronym for this one. So sometimes we'll encourage people to visualize a big red stop sign. Um, some people wear a hair elastic on their wrist or some kind of a, a bracelet or rubber band so that they can literally snap it. And the idea behind this is as soon as that anxious thought enters your head, you want to stop it before you get caught up in the tailspin and then use the STOP acronym. So to ask, you know, am I feeling scared? What am I thinking? What would other helpful thoughts be? And then of course to praise yourself and use a different plan. So another CBT technique is exposure. So we just talked about realistic thinking and that's targeted at anxious um, thoughts, whereas the exposure is targeted at anxious behavior. So things like escape and avoidance. Uh, the idea with the exposure is that you need to overcome, in order to overcome your fear, you need to start to face it and do the things that you're afraid to do. 
Uh, so for example, if you have a teenager that's been away from school and they're saying there's no way, no how I can return for a full day, how can you break that down and start to expose them to that school day? So maybe they're going a modified day. They're just going one for one class and they're coming back home. They're going for two classes until they can work themselves back up to a full day again. So again, the training I went to, uh, the woman's name is Orrin Wagner, and she actually wrote this book. It's called The Worry Hill and Cycle of Avoidance. It's a children's book about obsessive compulsive disorder and its treatment. I find the analogy she uses though really helpful for anxiety and or OCD. Unfortunately, I couldn't copy the image very clear, but you can kind of get the idea that it's a hill there. So she talks about riding up and down the worry hill and compares it to literally riding your bike up and down a hill. So when you're riding uphill, it's hard, right? You've got to pedal hard, you've got to pedal fast if you're going to make it to the top. What Orrin would say is that the fear, the anxiety is at the top of that hill. So if you can work hard and get to the top and face that fear, what's going to happen when you come down the other side? You're going to coast, right? You don't even have to pedal, sometimes you have to pull on the brakes. Uh, the other thing that we can demonstrate with this is sometimes we're working hard, we get a quarter way up the hill, maybe halfway, even three quarters, and the fear and anxiety takes over and we say, uh-uh, I can't do it, and we come right back down. So that shows us when we do that how we have to start at the beginning, and it's just reinforcing the cycle of avoidance. And of course, she uses the RIDE acronym, the RIDE acronym. So she talks about renaming your thought, insisting that you're in charge instead of the anxiety, defy it, so it can be opposite, and then of course, enjoy your success and reward yourself. Sometimes that's a really helpful analogy for people to use. Another CBT technique is relaxation. And these techniques work on the premise that you cannot be relaxed and uptight at the same time. It's just not physically possible for your body to be in both states at the same time. So this means that anything you do that is the opposite of what the danger alarm system does will tend to shut it off. So deep breathing, visualization, progressive muscle relaxation. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about abdominal breathing. The key with this one is that most of us do it wrong. So if you ever see a baby sleeping, you'll see that they belly breathe, right? You see their belly going up and down. Most of us, as we face life and pressures, start doing this really shallow chest breathing. So I'd encourage you the next time you're stressed out to check how you're breathing, and that's probably how you'll find you're doing it. I'm just going to demonstrate proper abdominal breathing. Feel free to try it with me or wait to try it in the comfort of your own home. If you put your hand on your belly, that's how you're going to know if you're doing proper abdominal breathing. So I'm going to take a deep breath in. If I'm taking a deep breath in properly, my belly is going to inflate kind of like a balloon, and I'm going to see my hand go up. So my belly inflated, my hand went up. Now I'm going to let a full breath out. My belly is going to deflate. I'll see my hand go down. That's how you know you're doing a proper abdominal breath. Uh, with younger kids, sometimes what we tell them to do, it helps them remember, is to pretend they're smelling a flower to get that deep breath in. So, smelling flower, and then pretend you're blowing candles out on a birthday cake, right? Uh, so, if you can practice that skill, it's a good skill because you can use it anywhere. Now, teens will often say to me, I'm not going to do that if I'm on the bus. You don't have to. Once you've mastered it, you don't necessarily need to do the hand on the belly, right? You could be on the school bus, you could be in the middle of class, you could be at home, and you can practice deep breathing, and it will help relax your body, your whole system. And because you're focused on breathing properly, it tends to turn the anxious thoughts off. Uh, another technique would be progressive muscle relaxation. This one, uh, the idea is that you're kind of working from head to toe, and you're working through the different muscle groups. So you're tensing them as tight as you can. So if you're starting with your head, you kind of have your shoulders up to your ears. And the idea is that you want to hold that tension for a good 10 to 15 seconds. You really want to feel it and study it. And then you're going to let go, kind of like a rag doll, and you feel the difference. So as you work your way through that, again, it forces your body to relax. This one is a really good technique for people who struggle with falling asleep at night for a couple of reasons. Oftentimes it's because we can't turn the anxious thoughts off, right? We've got this this spin of thoughts going on. So when you're doing this kind of an exercise, it turns off the anxious thoughts long enough that you can focus on the relaxation. If you're gonna try 
buy this, I would encourage you to see if you can find a tape or a CD. When you're first learning it, it's much easier to listen to it. Um, in your handouts, there is an outline that will walk you through how to do it. But until you've mastered it, I find it kind of difficult to read and do it and really get enjoyment out of it. Whereas when you listen to the tape, it's like having an in-home instructor with you. I have a 20-minute tape that I've never heard the end of because I probably get to 10 minutes and I'm asleep. So, highly recommend it. And uh, as with anything, try, you know, give it a fair try. Some people will try it and it might feel weird at first, but try it a few times before you, before you knock it. <laughs> Some facts about CBT. It's not a cure, but an effective strategy to manage anxiety. It's not a quick fix. It may take up to six weeks to take effect. Improvements may be dramatic or gradual, and it must be followed as prescribed for approximately 10 to 16 weeks. That's because it takes a while to start to shift the, the thought process and the practice and strategies. The great thing about CBT is that there's no side effects. And the benefits can continue even after you've stopped it. So it's just like learning how to swim or ride a bike. Once you have that skill, you always have it, right? But you just need to practice it initially to, to master it. Some things to remember. It may not always feel like it, but anxiety does pass and it won't actually harm you. Avoidance obviously strengthens fear. Of course, exposure will, will weaken the fear. Uh, habituation is natural and automatic, and I've just included a definition of habituation here. So that's a decrease in responsiveness upon repeated exposure to a stimulus. So the more you expose yourself to the fear, the less powerful it's going to become. Exposure is necessary for habituation to take place, and anticipatory anxiety may be greater than anxiety during the actual exposure event. So if you have a teen that's been home from school for a while, it's hard to get back there because now it's like, well, I haven't seen my friends. If I go back, they're going to ask where I've been, what am I going to tell them? I'm so behind on schoolwork. And so it gets bigger and bigger. And sometimes when they get there, I go, oh, this wasn't quite as bad as I thought it was going to be. Not quite as bad as anticipation. So just to kind of summarize some of the skills for overcoming anxiety, it's important to identify and label the feelings and thoughts and we'll talk about that more in the next slide. Try to connect the body changes with the thoughts and feelings, and that will help identify specific triggers for anxiety. Develop realistic self-talk. Use self-calming and relaxation skills. Confront fears with gradual exposure. Develop problem-solving skills. Build confidence, independence, and self-reliance. So in your handout, I've included a couple activities for you to make reference to. Um, one is the fear plan, and that's designed for teens. So if they're, not, if they're struggling, it kind of walks them through a few questions they can do. Um, one of the other sheets has worry time activities. An example they give for worry time activities is to write the worry or the fear on a piece of paper and then carry it, have them carry it in their purse, in their pocket, and uh, take it out regularly. So maybe it's once an hour or every couple hours they're taking out and reading it. And the idea is that the more they expose themselves to that, the less powerful it will become. So it's that exposure idea again. Uh, another worry time activity, if you find that the worry is consuming them, is saying, okay, we're going to block off a chunk of time every day where you get to worry outside of that time. We're not going to worry. So some people will create a worry jar, a worry box, but again, you know, when they get home from school, instead of being spinning in anxiety for four or five hours before they go to bed, it's maybe from 8 to 8.30 is the time that they get to do their worrying. They put it in their worry box, then they know that it'll be there in the morning and they can pick up where they left off. Because sometimes people worry when they can't worry about their worry. So calm thinking. With calm thinking, we want to get them asking themselves these kind of questions. What am I worried about? Why does it worry me? What are the chances it will happen? What proof do I have that it will happen? What else could happen? And what other possibilities exist? So what if it does happen? And how could I handle it if it happened? When people can answer these questions, when they feel like they have a plan in place, it helps reduce the anxiety. Because then it's like, OK, well, if the absolute worst thing did happen, at least I know what I could do. 
So just getting back to uh, anxiety and school refusal. Uh, with this, the first thing you want to do is identify the reasons for the school refusal. Is it related to anxiety or are there maybe other issues going on? Is there bullying going on at school? Maybe there's a learning disability and they're really feeling the, the academic pressures. Try to help them change the negative self-talk and increase the comp talk. Establish daily structure and routine. That's really important. Um, bedtime routines and morning routines. Build an anxiety and avoidance hierarchy, and we're going to talk about that in the next slide. Practice gradual exposure. Try to shift parental attention to, to uh, desired behaviors. And this can be tough sometimes. So if you have a teen that's been home from school for a while, and uh, you know they're promising they're going to go to school this week, and this week turns into, well, next week, next week, next week. Maybe they've gone to school two days this week when they promised they would go all five. Instead of saying to them, what happened to the other three, try to just focus on those two, you know? That's great that you made it those two days. What can we do next week to try to get you to the third? Remove and invert rewards for anxiety and refusal to go to school. So that means removing things like TV, video game systems, Facebook. If you have a child that's not going to school because of anxiety, they should not be sleeping in whenever they want and then have access to all these things because that makes it even more attractive to be home from school, right? Um, so it's important for them to try to maintain their morning routine. If they're not going to school because of anxiety, they're still getting up. They're getting dressed. If they're not doing schoolwork at school, there's an expectation that they're trying to work on it at home, or at least reading or doing some extra chores. Um, but again, important not to have access to Facebook and all those other sorts of things. Um, and of course, the board for effort. So uh, to look at a specific example of school refusal hierarchy, there is a copy of the feeling thermometer in your handouts. So not the PowerPoint slides, but the other handouts. And you can use this feelings thermometer for just about anything. I'm just using it tonight for school refusal. Um, and the idea is that you would use that thermometer to rank your feelings related to each activity. So whatever the fear is, for this one, the idea is that we're going to try to help the person return to school. So in this example, this youth is saying, saying that they feel a two. So just a little twinge when they think about waking up and doing schoolwork at home. So that's not even going to school, that's just waking up and doing schoolwork at home. They're at a two. Whereas they feel a ten. So that's their highest. That's their scariest. That's their biggest fear at the thoughts of being at school all day. So just to give you an idea of what a full one would look like, number one here, they're saying to wake up, get dressed, and do schoolwork at home as a two, to get in the car, drive to school, and return home. So they're not actually going into the building. They just want you to kind of drive them, see the school, go back home as a four, to stay in the car in the school parking lot for about 15 minutes before turning around and return home as a five to drive to the bus stop and wait for the bus but not get in, they've ranked as a six, to ride the bus to school and return home as a six, and then we've jumped down to number nine here. So to actually attend two classes with a phone call home to mom or dad for support and reassurance, that's a nine for them. And then 10, their absolute worst fear is to attend those two classes without the phone call home to mom or dad. So what I want to demonstrate here is how important it is to break it down in small, manageable steps. Um, again, I think sometimes we're worried about if they're not getting their credits, are they going to achieve their year? We just want to see them back to school full time. When you have a youth that hasn't been going to school and you're trying to jump over here and get them back full time, nine times out of ten it's going to fail because they're not ready and you haven't dealt with some of those underlying issues. So sometimes they might go for a couple days, but then they slowly, you know, it becomes I'm sick, we're home for a day or two, and all of a sudden all over again, they're not going. So it's much better to break it up into these small baby steps. Really, um, item number one, you should do for a week or two until they've mastered it. Only then would you move on to step number two. And as they move through those steps, they start to feel more confident. Because it's like, hey, you know what, I can manage this, and my number 10 isn't feeling so scary. And even if it is still scary, I know I've got some time to really get there. Uh, so other ways you can help your anxious adolescents. One would be to complete an assessment of their general health, and that's to rule out any other potential causes. 
ensure their basic needs are being met, such as proper nutrition and sleep. Establish routines, so relaxing bedtime routine is really important, and that's where that uh, progressive muscle relaxation can come in. Make sure you plan ahead for homework and projects, and again, break large tasks into more manageable chunks. So, it'd be a really good idea to invest in a day planner, or a whiteboard for their bedroom above their desk, or their desk is, or um, a monthly calendar, sometimes you can even get four months in advance with the dry erase. So today's October 7th, for example, if they had a major project coming up a month from now, that's due November 7th, help them chunk it out so that week one, maybe they're going to the library, they're just gonna research what topics they're interested in, pick a topic. Week two, they're just gonna jot down some ideas in point form under the headings they need for their essay. Week three, they're gonna turn those point forms into full sentences, and then week four, they're gonna pull it all together and they're ready to hand it in. And that, again, doesn't feel so daunting. It's broken down into those small chunks. And uh, of course, it's important to provide firm, consistent parenting, so predictable parenting. Um, when you're struggling with anxiety, sometimes it may not feel like they want your support, but they do. So when they're spending and they're not feeling grounded, they're gonna look at you to help them feel grounded. If they find that you're spinning with them, that's going to be more difficult for them to manage. And as I said earlier, you're kind of going from one parenting extreme to the other. So the, the uh, you know, extra loving, super gentle, to the strict, 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 that's going to be hard. They, they, they just don't know what to uh, expect. So it's much better when you're doing predictive parenting. Uh, provide tools to relax and cope. We've already talked about some of that. Slowly encourage risk taking, so just slightly above your comfort level. You don't want to push them too far too fast. Participate in physical activity, as we all know that relaxes muscles and it releases endorphins that can increase self-esteem. And try to teach them the language of choice. So for example, saying to them that you can choose to be in charge of the anxiety or you can let it be in charge of you. And that helps to externalize it a little bit. Some areas of focus for the family. Uh, important to think about your own experiences of anxiety as a parent. So when you reflect back on your childhood, were you an anxious child? What was helpful to you, what wasn't? Um, and maybe you're an adult now and you're still struggling with anxiety. Just important to reflect on how that might be impacting your parenting. Self-care for parents and the family as a whole is really important. Obviously, unconditional love and acceptance for your child with the anxiety. Try to have realistic expectations practice new parenting strategies, understand behaviors that delay recovery. So if you have a teen that's kind of going to bed at 10 o'clock one night and they're up till 1 o'clock the next night, not a good idea, right? Because that's not going to help with bedtime routines. Um, if you have a child that's gone to school Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and you're so proud of them, and you don't reward them by saying, we well, can stay home Friday. Again, that's going to delay their recovery. Try to disengage from your child's symptoms. So again, that's just so that you're not totally spinning with them. It's just like when you're on a plane and they tell you to put on your oxygen mask before you put on your child's. So what the school can do to help, uh, again, in your handouts, I've included a handout titled Strategies and Designs to Support Anxious Students, and that was developed by the Waterloo Region District School Board. It's really important to talk to teachers and school staff about what's been going on. So what you're seeing at home, or are they seeing at, that, at school and vice versa? By opening up lines of communication, then you can work together to develop a plan to support your child at school. School staff are generally very helpful. So they'll look at whatever options they have available to them, whether that's setting up a child youth worker that can meet with your child. Um, maybe it is looking at a modified day or an alternative school, plan, school program. Um, there's options, it's just a matter of developing it, a plan and putting it in place. Um, you'll notice throughout my presentation that uh, there's the names and dates. So I've done up a couple slides of references so that if you're interested in reading it about any more of the, that information, you have a place to find it. You can also ask me at the end if you want to know. And then I'm just going to skip ahead to resources. Um, and before I jump into that, the focus of my presentation tonight was obviously on using cognitive behavioral therapy strategies with anxiety, but I wanted to make sure people are aware, um, as I'm sure you are, that there are other options as well. So there's always the route of having a formal assessment done and maybe considering medication, if that's what the doctor feels is appropriate and you as a parent feels appropriate. 
appropriate for your child. Um, alternative therapies are also becoming more and more popular, so some people are choosing to meet with a homeopathic doctor to see if there's any herbal remedies or energy therapy, brain gym exercises, things like that. And there's a number of different um, routes you can take in counseling to tackle anxiety. So as I say, my focus tonight was on CBD. In terms of resources, I wanted to let people know that our front door site, Access to Child and Youth Services, does have a walk-in service that they run every Wednesday from noon until 7.30 p.m. So that's an opportunity to go in and meet with a walk-in counselor if you wanted to chat about some of the struggles you're having. A teen could go in on their own, have a family session, or you might just want to go in as a parent or a caregiver to ask some questions and develop some strategies. Uh, at that same location, we also have a resource library where you can access books and videos. There is an excellent video there called Fighting Their Fears, Child and Youth Anxiety, and I wanted to show it tonight. I was worried I'd run out of time. I haven't, but um, excellent video. I highly recommend it. It has three vignettes, so real life stories of children and teens that are struggling with anxiety and OCD and the journey they're taking with that. Uh, in terms of some of the other local community agencies, there's KW Counseling Services, Mosaic Counseling and Family Services, and they both offer individual family and group counseling. So there's Green River Hospital if you're looking for a formal assessment or outpatient counseling. Just be mindful that they do require a uh, referral from your family doctor. And then, of course, take a peek at tonight's handouts. There's some activities in there. There's also a list of resources where I've listed books, videos, and websites that might be helpful for you for more information about anxiety.